And Kirby is, well, Kirby is just Kirby. If you can't beat him, eat him. Kirby had a rough transition into 3D. Ever since the 2000s with Kirby 64, we have been teased time and time again with a full 3D Kirby game, while other long-running franchises like Mario, Sonic, Zelda, even Bubsy tried. Out of those series gave the third dimension a try and succeeded. And then there was Kirby. After Crystal Shards, Kirby went into a little of a dark era. Not to say the games released during that time were bad, but it seemed like the pink puffle was stuck on the handhelds while the console only got spin-offs. It's not like Hal wasn't trying. A little look behind the scenes will show the many struggles of making a 3D Kirby game. Maybe because of motivation, budget, technical difficulties, creative difficulties, or any other reason, we never got that 3D Kirby game. Being the only remains of that era, one single screenshot. After the failed experiments, Hal went back to the drawing board, but this time with a new director, Shin Yagumasaki. And after an amazing remake of the beloved Kirby Superstar, this new team was ready to make a new console game. That game being Kirby's Return to Dreamland. Often regarded as one of, if not THE best Kirby game, with the promise of the formula introducing the already mentioned Superstar, Return to Dreamland had an almost perfect gameplay. Coupled that with some amazing aesthetics, some outstanding music, and developing the universe, characters, and lore of the series more than any other game. Maybe it was too good. The next three mainline Kirby games took the formula and ran with it, adding some little changes to freshen up the gameplay. And while those games are also complete successes, with Planet Robot being often called one of the best 2D platformers of all time, after the Star Allies, there was little of a Kirby fatigue. For 10 years we have been stuck with the same formula, people were tired, and Hal knew, the pieces were lining up. First we had Kirby 3D Rumble, a high score minigame in Planet Robot, in 3D. Then Kirby Blood Blast, an upgrade of same minigame turned into a small, but full game. After that we had Kirby Bar Royale, a minigame collection with some of the minigames being in 3D. This time featuring copy abilities, showing us how they would work in this new dimension. And after that, we had Star Allies, which was the end of an era, bringing all characters back, having references to the other games in every corner, and with a final picture showing Kirby walking into the sunset with a tear in his eyes. One final look at the code of Kirby Fighters 2 showing some aspects of a potential 3D Kirby game? Everyone knew what was coming. And here we are. Announced in September 23rd, 2021 on a Nintendo Direct and later released in March 25th, 2022, the 3D Kirby game finally came. I've been waiting my whole life for this moment. This game is very special to me and to millions of people. I know it took a lot of time to make this video but I had to take my time and reflect on everything this game has to offer. And I think enough time has passed. I'm ready. This is my gift to the Kirby community, to the Kirby series, to everyone watching this, and to me. So like and subscribe if you're new here, share with your friends, and get ready, because this is... Why Kirby and the Forgotten Land is a masterpiece. Breaking the mood completely, the first thing we see after opening the game is a simple option between the wild mode and spring breeze mode. As far as I know, in spring breeze mode you get more health and in wild mode you get some bonus coins at the end. Okay, I can't complain about more options, I guess. After that we get our opening cutscene and oh my god, they made this more beautiful every time. And unlike the one from Starlight, this one actually explains stuff. Kirby's riding his warps are having a fun time like usual until a portal out of nowhere comes and sucks everyone up, including Kirby. And that's another dimension, neat! 
but most importantly makes Kiwi squish and stretch in weird ways. We'll find about that more later. Next thing we see is Kirby waking up on a beach and the game starts. It's simple. Kirby goes to a new world and now he can stretch. He explains the new location and explains the main gimmick, but it still leaves questions. Who made that portal? What is this new world? What happened to the Wildies? And you will find the answer as the game goes. Great start! And speaking of a great start, this is our tutorial. It is pretty basic. The aesthetics are cool with faint sounds of the main team, but otherwise it's not that special. You can jump, you can inhale, you can float, you can crouch, slide, and you can do a dodge roll by crouching and moving the control stick. Nothing we haven't seen, but because it's in 3D, it gives more purpose to the basic move. Holy sh! Is that a Kirby 64 reference? A few more steps seen, and we get to this. The music starts, the world opens, and you get to experience the first copy ability, Sword. This ability shows perfectly the pros and cons of how abilities work in this game. Sword takes a lot from its 2D version, you still have the multi sword attack and the spin slash, which were very similar to how they do in 2D, but because it's a new dimension, these classic moves get more use. For example, spin slash, instead of being a simple spin, in Forgotten Land it's a big powerful move that you need to charge, which makes it better, but it also makes it riskier. So now you have to decide, do I go for a simple swing, or do I charge the spin slash for big damage? That's all good, but what I don't like is that you also get to use the classic sword combo. Stab into upper slash into sword dive, which is good, but how you do it is not. You need to crouch, press the jump button which activates the stab, then during that animation you need to press the jump button again to do the upper slash and then press the attack button to do the finisher. Not only is this move more complicated than 90% of the other moves in 2D Kirby, but also the game doesn't tell you. For some reason there is no pause description. The only way to know what moves every ability has is by pressing buttons randomly or by getting a random comment from the weapon shop waddle dee. It's not a problem with most abilities since they are simpler than the 2D counterparts, but for some abilities it took me weeks to know some moves, and I know other people had the same problem. Complain aside, I really like this sword. This ability was always one of my favorites and this version of it is no different. An amazing ability even if the beast example one of the problems with this game, but once you know the secrets it's a blast to use. Speaking of blast, some enemies and a whole tutorial later we have our second ability, Bomb. Bomb works very similar to how it does in the 2D games, with 3 simple attacks. You can throw bombs normally, you can hold the button to aim, and you can use Bomb Ball, where you roll the bomb like a bowling ball. Unlike the other games, the bombs you throw take a while to explode if they don't hit anything. They will instead roll on the ground if they touch another bomb, or think Kirby kicks them into enemies. Because of this, Bomb got a huge fun upgrade in my opinion. This ability was always one of those that I liked but I wasn't dying to get. Now in Forgotten Land they are super fun to use. Some of later evolution makes this ability even more fun, but even in base form, lining a ton of bombs and kicking them into enemies and boxes is super fun, and the 3D aspect makes it more creative to use instead of just pressing the attack button as fast as possible. Another great ability. But sadly, Bomb is overshadowed by what is in the next room. Hey look, another pre-rendered cutscene. And this is not any pre-rendered cutscene, this cutscene is the introduction to our main gimmick, Mouthful Mode. Thanks to the strange portal, Kiwi can now inhale objects way bigger than usual. Actually, instead of inhale, I should say suck. Unlike normal copy abilities, Kiwi doesn't eat the object to attain his powers. For Mouthful Mode, Kiwi puts his entire body around the object, which is hilarious. And just like Sword before, our first month of mode is a perfect example of what makes this gimmick great while showing some of the problems. This is Car Mouth. Carby. It does exactly what you think. Press the attack button to go fast. It breaks boxes, rocks, runs over enemies, pushes logs, and even destroys walls. Which is exactly what we do in the car tutorial. This also brings up a big discussion with Malfoy mode. Most if not all the transformation could have been copied with this. Like with car mode, you can clearly see that wheel will replace it just fine, but there are some problems with that logic. You can only use Malfoy modes when the game wants you to do it, which lets help make specific section design for only certain Malfoy mode transformations. And also that would mean that the whole game needs to be planned with that new ability, which sounds is in 2D, but on a 3D game? You need to triple check every spot in the game. And another benefit of Malfoy Mode is that they can and do get super creative with what they can do with this gimmick, which we will see as we go on. Rumbling aside, we hit a bridge and...
lyrics? In my Kirby game? Jokes aside, Welcome to a New World is a fantastic song that perfectly encapsulates the feeling of adventure, wonder and excitement that this game gives, coupled with some amazing shots of Kirby exploring the city and we have a perfect introduction. But the level is not over yet, after that amazing song we get another pre-render cutscene? Jesus Christ, three already? That's more than every other Kirby game. Well, this cutscene shows us our main antagonist, the Beast Pack. We actually saw them in the other cutscene, but this is where we get introduced to them as our main enemies. This fluffy gang is after the Wild Dees, capturing them in cages. And you know what they say, if you mess with the Wild Dees, you mess with me. Strangely, they also captured this little blue rat. After a fight introducing us to the enemy gauntlet, we rescued the creature and... Still perfect. The rat tells us that he was fighting the beast pack with the wild deed. He then goes to say that he's alone and he wants to help them. Kirby being Kirby decides to join and immediately makes friends with Elphilin. He is super evil. Elphilin is like the ribbon or airline of this game, following us through the game, telling us tips and just chilling with us. Now that the level is over, we can finally grab the website and... I forgot about Bandana Wild D. I swear we're not spending an hour on the first level. Bandana Wild D is our partner in multiplayer. Give your friend a controller, press plus, and they will play as the best boy. Bandana D is technically our third copy ability, since he's completely unique compared to the other ability, meaning that Spear is once again exclusive to him. While it makes Bandana D more unique, it still bothers me a little bit. Maybe you could select him in an extra mode, or if player 2 could choose between him and a yellow QB since they are stuck with Bandana D during the whole game, which can be annoying to some. At least he has a pretty good moveset, he got classic moves like the multi spear thrust, the triple spear throw, and the amazing watercopter. Overall, a pretty good moveset, too bad he's tangled with so many problems. Ok, for real, we can begin the game. Downtown Grassland, our first normal stage. While the level design is nothing crazy, it introduces a lot of mechanics that will be useful throughout the game. For example, touching these red tulips will show a mission counter. Now, every stage has three wild leaves to rescue, similar to other collectibles like sandstones or cow cubes, but every level also has three missions. This mission can be anything, eat a specific food item, destroy a poster, or in this case, make five tulips bloom. The problem is that you will not know what the missions are until you complete them or by finishing the level which unlocks one mission. Missions change the game so much, now you have to explore the levels and interact with whatever you see, which I love. It makes so you can enjoy each level to the fullest, taking advantage of all the extra space of a 3D game. It can be annoying at times to replay the stage or and or again for a small detail that you didn't notice, but at least for me, the game is so much fun that I didn't care. And I got most missions to my first try, so I wasn't replaying every stage 5 times or whatever. Moving on, we can have another ability, Cutter. The moveset is pretty simple, but super fun. You can throw the cutter just like normal, but you can now hold it after the throw to make it bigger and more powerful. And of course, final cutter is here in all its glory. After that, we have our second mouth for more ability, Bending Mouth. With it, you can throw cans of soda at enemies and even break some walls. Not the best ability, but it goes to show how funny and creative mouth for mode can be. And after breaking a wall with said Bending Mouth, we get our first gotcha capsule. Again, taking inspiration from other collectibles like keychains and stickers, these capsules give you little figurines at the end of the level with some having lore. And thank god these do not have the same chance to get a double like the other games. They're still happy and they're still lame, but I didn't get near the amount of doubles compared to Triple Deluxe and Planner Robot. And this level keeps on going. Then we have Cone Mount. With it, you can summon the ground to destroy certain parts like the ground or some pipes. After some pro gamer moves, we get our first mini boss fight, Wall Edge. Original from Doom Dreamland, this mini boss is a very simple yet deadly one. Taking advantage of a 3D space, he will put a shield from him, and the only way to attack him in this state is to attack his back. Really showing how even the simplest mini bosses can be more interesting in a new dimension. And it should be obvious, but this mini boss gives us the Sword ability. Finally, we climb a building, defeat this lizard thing, and beat the level. But before that, don't mouth! You can rotate the control stick to open the dome. Next level, please. Through the tunnel. Right off the bat, we're introduced to another classic Kirby ability, fire. Pressing the attack button will make Kirby shoot fire. But if you press it while moving in the air, you will do a fireball attack. It's a simple ability, but it's still as good. Though I kind of miss fireball spin, which is my favorite attack from the ability. This ability gets the spotlight of the level. 
with it being dark tunnels full of moving platforms. You can use the fire ability to light lanterns and to raise fuse cannons to find goodies. Yo ho ho, this is not all just fire puzzles. We also get another mouthful mode ability, Stairs Mouth. <laughs> Look at him. <laughs> Look at him, he's so dumb. <laughs> I love him. You can follow over to destroy everything in your path and you can position it in ways that will help Kirby access new areas. This is one of my personal favorites for taking advantage of the fact that you can exit mouthful mode whenever you can for some creative puzzles. Before we move to the next level, with the waddles we collect, we discovered some weird portals. Those are the Threshold Road levels, mini stages that challenge you by forcing a specific ability or mouthful mode on you, and by having a strict time limit. Every world also has two secret treasure roads that you discover by exploring the overworld, which are usually more harder and more experimental. And they are pretty fun. They use your abilities really well in creative ways that show you the potential of each ability. Even showing you some secret modes. Unlike the main levels, each and every one of these will not be talked about in this video. As that will take a million years. But me and Sonic want to let you know that they are amazing and to add a nice difficulty bump to the main story. Especially if you want to get all of the target times. Which gives you nothing, by the way. Something most of us would have liked to know before. And I bet that Sonical did them all because he's a literal psychopath. And, uh, also me. <laughs> now for real, the next stage is... Rocky Rolling Road. This stage features two abilities, but I want to talk about Needle in the next stage, since he gets overshadowed by your first new ability, Gun. I mean, Ranger. This copy ability lets Kirby with a blunderbuss. In other terms, a gun. With it, Kirby can hold the attack button to aim in any direction, Holding it for some time will also make the blast bigger and more deadly. You can also hold the attack button in the air for a quick stream of bullets, great for close range combat, and keeping the pace. Also, I haven't talked about it, but you can do a perfect dodge by dodging an attack within a pretty generous time window. What's cool is that every copy has a counterattack. Most counterattacks are just a finisher of combos, but Ranger is one of the few that has a unique attack, shooting rapid fire shots at the enemies, so I held that information for now. I love this ability. While well, it's not one of my favorites to use due to having to stop every time you want to shoot, the range of his weapon is amazing and come on, how can I not like keep it with a gun? We have been joking about this for years and it finally happened. The stage itself focuses a lot on, you guessed it, rolling rocks, while well, giving some space to let Ranger shine. If it weren't for the introduction of Ranger, this stage would be one of the most forgettable ones, but it does feature a pretty fun section with Caramel. Also worth noting that this is the first level with a hard room. Howl rooms are secret areas where developers remind you of the company responsible for ruining your life with a pink ball. Usually with tons of collectibles and abilities to try, these rooms are also famous for being hidden really well, but for some reason they are all discovered in a period of less than 24 hours because secrets is a concept that no longer exists. To access this Howl room in particular you need to climb up a tree at the end of a level and hit the tiny target in the background with the ranger ability. Once you do that, some blocks appear letting you access the secret room. And wow, would you look at that? That sure is a Howl room! Yogs aside, I love secret hall rooms, they are one of my favorite things to discover when a new Kiwi game comes out, and the one from Forgotten Land are no exception. Especially love the music that plays in the background, it's a melee of all the other Kiwi Switch games. Which is a perfect reminder that the Kiwi Fighters 2 main theme is one of the best songs in the series, don't add me. Moving on to... A trip to a live mo. This one's really good. Starting with a beautiful wang of the mo, this level takes full advantage of the post-apocalyptic but cute atmosphere. And actually, while we are here, we can talk about some graphical things. This game looks amazing. We haven't gone to the outstanding parts that show this game, but even so far as the first world, you can really see how beautiful this game is. It's not your just typical grassland, it's an abandoned city that got overrun by nature. It makes each location feel like a real place. There are signs and buildings and roads that are not only great set pieces, but they also work really well as obstacles. But sadly, there are downsides, with the biggest one being the frame rate. This game runs at a 30 FPS, a very stable 30 FPS, but it's still not a smooth 60. This is one of those games where you don't need frame perfect reaction, but it still feels a little sloppy at the beginning. You do get used to it pretty fast, but I'm sorry if this is a super high bar to pass. Mario Odyssey came 5 years earlier, runs at a smooth 60 FPS, and that game is huge! Maybe the Mario team has some godlike programmers in there, but I would expect a more linear game to run at that same frame rate. And also, the enemies in the background run at like 2 FPS, so there is clearly an effort to optimize the game. Maybe I'm just a stupid guy that knows nothing about games. Going back to the actual level, a trip to a live mode is exactly what the name says. A trip through an abandoned mall. There are ads everywhere, food places, electric stairs that don't work, multiple paths leading to secrets, 
and an overall great looking and feeling level, which is in part thanks to another ability, Needle. In 2D, Needle was one of my least favorite abilities, it was always too slow and clunky to use, but in Forgotten Land, oh my god, this ability is amazing! It's basically like a little Katamari Damacy game, you press the attack button to go into Needle mode and then you can roll around for a little time. But the fun part is that you can run over enemies and boxes to keep your momentum and when you're done, KB launches the enemy forwards. It makes everything super smooth and fun to use, probably the biggest upgrade from 2D to 3D. What also got a huge upgrade is the invincibility thing. Yeah, invincibility candies are back and they are just as fun as ever, but this time they went insane with the team. That amazing guitar gets me every time. It's kinda weird that they put so much effort into something that you will only see a couple of times. But who cares when you had the best mouth for mode in the game? Storage mouth! Amazing! Hey, you get to destroy a wall with this mouth for mode, don't talk trash about my boy! A little bit more exploring, we have our second mini boss, Wild Frosty. He actually managed to make Frosty look kind of intimidating. Just like Wild Edge before, this old friend keeps most of the classic moves but makes it unique by the 3D aspect. What is more important is the ability Frosty gives Kirby, Ice. I ain't gonna lie, this one kinda sucks. Very similar to Fire, you press the attack button to speed Ice, but if you mash the button while running, you also slide inside an Ice Cube, leaving Ice on the ground. You also have a special Ice Guard, but most importantly, you can still freeze enemy and kick them into other enemies. But I don't know man, it's just boring for me. Maybe the 3D aspect makes launching enemies less fun, but I think my biggest problem is that this ability is just slow and not that satisfying, like there is no big move. You can freeze bosses and mini bosses, which is really cool, but it feels random, like sometimes you touch them and they freeze and other times you defeat the boss before you can see the ice particles. So yeah, this is my least favorite ability by far and I'm not alone on that. But who cares, this though is amazing. The worst part is that it ends, leading us to the boss. Oh wait, hold up. Good job boys, the brawl at the mall. Just like previous Kirby games, the bosses have their own mini levels, nothing substantial but it builds up the intensity and I gotta say, Kirby and the Forgotten Land does that better than any other Kirby game. When in a game like say Robobot, you walk a little, get a power up and enter a big door, in this game you can really feel the tension. You see a big shadow looming over you, you then see a mysterious creature for a split second through a window, you then see a bunch of bananas and then you enter a small room. The music gets more intense, the camera moves to see the back of this huge creature, he turns around, and then... This is our first real boss, the strong armed beast, Gorimondo. And what an introduction. Yeah, our first boss is not wispy good this time, we actually get to fight one of the biggest members of the beast pack. And this boss, well, it's pretty easy, I mean it is the first boss after all, still makes a great impression. His huge body, the way he moves, the big but slow attacks, make you feel small and pathetic as you avoid his shockwave by giant boulders. Oh, and taking pages from DK, I see. But just like I said before, this boss is pretty easy, his attacks are all pretty slow and easy to avoid really showcasing how fast the dodge is, so you shouldn't have any problems. Until you beat the level. So far I haven't complained about the missions, but I have to say that I hate how they handle them in the bosses. There is always a mission for not taking damage and for beating it under a time limit, which are fine, but the other two are a pain. One is beating that boss with a specific copy ability and the other one is doing a specific action during the boss, like in this case he's going in between Gorimon's leg. There is no indication what ability you need to use or what special act you need to do and it's simple try and error. That's no fun. At least with the levels, if you explore and interact with different mechanics and set pieces, it's very probable that you will get almost if not every mission in your first try, but with bosses it's near to impossible. I don't like that. After finishing the boss, we are transported to the same place where we found Erfilin, which is now called Waddle D Town. After rescuing the Waddle Dees, they all went to this town. As we progress through the game and as we find more Waddle Dees, they will reveal this place filling with NPCs to interact and builders which provide upgrades or fun minigame. If you get every Waddle Dee in World 1, you should be able to access a few things like the theater, letting you rewatch some of the game's cutscenes, 
the gacha machine where you can spend some coins to get a random capsule and what all this weapon shop letting you quickly grab abilities and more importantly where you can evolve your existing abilities. You even get two blueprints from Chakram Cutter and Volcano Fire. But to actually unlock these new evolved forms, you need to find the blueprint and then you need to spend some starter coins and rare stones. You get star coins all over the game for basically anything. The rare stones on the other hand are only obtained by completing some treasure routes, giving those levels more purpose. Well, let's look at this new evolution. Chakron Cutter replaces the boomerang with two faster chakrons that come back in a circular manner. While Volcano Fire on the other hand lets Kibi speed flaming rocks and makes the dash faster. After killing innocent civilians, we can move on to the next world. Everbay Coast This world, just like natural airplanes, takes the simple idea of a classic Kirby level, in this case your standard beach level, but expands on it from a gameplay level and from a aesthetic level. This philosophy is actually a fundamental part of the entire game and as we move onwards, we will see how creative some of the later levels will be. But let's not be hasty and move to the first stage. Abandoned Beach Starting a pretty big area, we're introduced to the main gimmick of the world, water. Unlike previous Kirby games, we can dive under the sea and explore the ocean. In this case, we just use our trusted floaty to get across these parts. What the world and the level focuses more are the sandy areas with some tiny islands to explore. And this level is a good example of that. What the level also has is a naughty, which means sleeps in the game. Let's try it out! Amazing! No joke, sleep is actually your fault. It takes a page from Squid Squad letting you heal while you sleep. But you know, without the need of a stupid ability goal. I would prefer giving this classic ability an action moveset like how Battle Royale did it, but if you want to keep it more classic and simple form, this is the best way to do it. But who cares about sleep when we get another mini boss? This time being Bonkers. Just like the other two classic mini bosses, Bonkers takes the core moves from the 2D games but in 3D. Just gotta know how sick the design looks, especially the hammer. And speaking of hammer, hammer! Just like so, this ability has always been one of my favorites, if not my favorite. And for Garland, does it justice. The standard combo attack is a triple hammer from Return to Dreamland. Wow, I never expect to see this move again after it got taken on triple locks. You also got the classic giant swing and hammer flip. But even those got an upgrade. If you hold the button after doing a giant swing, you do a little jump. But hammer flip got the biggest upgrade. This move was one of the best in every single game it appears. Except in Salas where they made a chargeable move and completely ruined it. And while well, in this game you can also charge it, it's way faster and way stronger. Making the move fun again. Also you can do this. Yeah, I like this ability. Next up we find a secret room with a time. Not again, not again! Moving on, we encounter a new month of ability, Ring Mount. This one has multiple uses. You can press the attack button to send a gust of wind that turns windmills, but more importantly, you can hop on a boat and use those same gusts of wind to repair yourself. You can even attack normally on killable enemies and destroy walls. Also, you can be a part of a sign. That level was pretty fun, but has nothing compared to the next one. Concrete Isles. While Abandoned Beach feels more like a natural beach with some artificial stuff here and there, like something you would see in most real world beaches, just without all the screaming and the guy selling you food that is most likely intoxicated as f Concrete Isles is the more industrial side. It feels like Overload Ocean from Robot, but abandoned. And, you know, I always thought about this little relation, like Plant Robot is a game about technology taking over nature, and for Gun Land we have the opposite. Nature taking over technology? You know, just some random food for thought. Anyways, in this stage we find another classic ability, Crash. It's exactly like in the last few games, you can explode or you can charge it into a more powerful explosion. But after that, we have our second and last new ability, Drill. With this ability, Kirby can dig through the ground collecting items and popping out to hit enemies. You can also create a massive stone by doing a loop in the ground. But strangely, my favorite move has to be the dash by using it in the air. Don't ask me why, I just love going fast. Comparing this ability to the other newcomer, Ranger, Drill is often considered the worst of the two, with some people even saying that it's overall the worst ability in the game. And for me, it's a little bit more complicated. Whenever I have two or more options, I never choose Drill, but when the game forces me to use it, I love it. 
I think Drill is one of those abilities where they are not fun by themselves, like a sword or a fire, but instead one that complements the level design perfectly, more like a wheel or a rock. And this level is a perfect example of that with all of the star pieces scattered all around the level. And it has Scissorlith Mouth, which lets you go up and down. What more can you ask? Another mouthful mode ability? Well, here you have Pipe Mouth. I love him. From one amazing level to another, we have... Scale the Cement Summit. The level is self-explanatory. While most levels have us go forward, this level shows us the possibility of vertical levels in a 3D setting. The first section is more straightforward with ladders avoiding cannons and enemies, while the second section has more of a mountain-like design. But before that we have another miniboss. This is Florina, our first and only new miniboss. She kinda bad. Anyways, she attacks while dancing so fast she becomes a tornado. She can also launch actual tornadoes. This one is pretty annoying to dodge at first due to most of her attacks homing on you but dodge rolling eliminates most problems. Overall, a great addition. And that's every miniboss in the game. Yeah, only four. I mean, I get it, the new dimension, all these new bosses, way more complex than the 2D counterparts, but how often they start throwing these guys towards the end game, it can feel very repetitive. Maybe one or two more would satisfy me, but then again, they don't have much capabilities to work with. Speaking of which, here is Tornado, another classic ability. Tornado does exactly what it always does, but with some minor changes. It makes Kirby turn into an unstoppable and hard to control tornado, taking everything in its path and launching them at all enemies when it's over. And while you can't ascend like in other games, this ability is super fun to use in 3D. It's still hard to control, but I find myself using this ability all the time. It may not be the boss killer it was in other games, but it takes the new role of a speedrunner's dream. And that's all the abilities. Only 12, well, 10 if you don't go sleep and crash. And I ain't gonna lie, this is my biggest problem with the game. While well, the abilities we have are all fun, except <laughs> you, more abilities will always mean more ways to play the game, more puzzles to complete, and more fun to be had. And only having 12 abilities limits that a lot. This is the one aspect that sequel can destroy this game in. And I hope the people at HAL learn how to make abilities work in the new style to improve in the future. But thankfully, all is not as lost, and we have evolved capabilities with us finding the first blueprint in this same level. I'll talk about the ability after the level, but I just have to say how f***ing smart Hull is. The moment we experience every ability, they decide to introduce to the new mechanic that makes the aspect of discovering and using abilities feel fresh again. The pacing of this game is immaculate, it feels like every time you think you have seen everything this game has to offer, BAM, they give you something else to play, not only with the level design ability evolution, but also with things like the treasure roads and the mouth of my abilities, which is a great segue to the next part of the level. After inhaling an archway, we get arch mouth. Unlike most mouth of modes, this one switches the gameplay completely to an on-rails flyer, making you glide through a set pad avoiding obstacles and collecting goodies. It's not as in-depth as something like Star Fox, but it's another great way the game keeps the pacing. You never know when things are going to change, it gives you interest in to see what every level has to offer, which is why I'm doing this video going level by level. This game is so huge and so full of ideas, I feel there is no better way to explain this. Just f I love this game. Before we move on to the next level, let's look at the new blueprint that we got. This is Cloud and Needle. Apart from being an amazing reference to Kirby Seed 4, this version of Needle has the special benefit of dropping spiky projectiles every time you use it, which may not sound like much, but then again, Kirby 64 reference. Fast flowing waterworks. While Kirby may not be able to use his goggles to swim, he still has the trusty floaty, so this level takes advantage of that, using powerful currents and fun puzzles with both ring and surge mouth. All with an amazing song. Not much to talk about with this one, it's just a pretty good level. Although it does give us one of the best evolutions in the game, Chain Bomb. This evolution makes it so the bombs you throw will be linked. Explode one and you will explode all of them at once. Make long chains of bombs and the end explosion will be even bigger. This one is super fun to use. The aspect of forming bomb chains in such a way where you can hit all the enemies at once is so satisfying. It makes one of the most fun abilities even more fun. A perfect evolution. A cure while the animation later, we come to the boss, the Tropical Terror. With Grimondo breaking the tradition of Wispy Wood, I wonder what boss will be, oh never mind. This is Tropic Woods, the unfriendly frogs. Wow, how really breaking the norm here, it's not the first boss, it's the second boss. Yo, King Sai, Wispy Wood wasn't in Blah Blah, and if you have watched my video on that game, you will know that I love how to translate classic bosses in 3D. And while this is not THE Wispy, Tropic Woods is the next closest thing. 
and I think it delivers. This one has the classic moves like the apples, in this case big exploding coconuts, falling on you and the wind bullets. Face use where it gets more creative with more wind, more coconuts with a fence stopping you from attacking at certain angles, and when it's rules closing on you making the terrain hard to navigate. And just like Corimondo before, I love the design. If it's the worst thing by making him a pineapple tree. Get it? And I love the little facial hair. Also, fun fact, Tropic Wood is not part of the beast pack. We're just pinning him for the fun of it. I mean, the world is right there. Kibu had just opened the cage. I think he just likes building trees. After the boss fight, we get another blueprint. And you know, let's check in with Wildly Town. This place has gotten bigger since we last saw it. But before we see the new buildings, let's look at our new blueprint. This is Noble Ranger. Now we do wielding guns, bitch! Yeah, that's basically it. Your firepower doubles and the charge is a giant onslaught of bullets. It's not a game breaking a chain bomb, but this evolution makes Ranger a much faster and smoother ability to use, which was my biggest problem with the original ability, so I see this as a win. With that out of the way, let's look at what other things the town has to offer, starting with water deliveries. Amazing name, by the way. In here, you can enter present codes for a delivery present. You can find codes hidden all around the town, but there are some codes that you can only find on the internet. And my god, this is probably the most useless mechanic in the whole game. Who would see a random tweet from the Japanese account and go out of their way to bring Kivian the Forel and just for a couple of coins? But where do you receive these presents? Well, in front of your house, of course. That's right, after years of small prints, we can finally explore Kirby's house. In here you can display some figures that you have collected, you can sleep with an amazing cutscene and you can see how much KB fans spend of all these games, all with an amazing jazz rendition of Green Greens, like in the top 5 version of Green Greens and that's a long list. After that we have the Wildly Cafe, clearly inspired by the real life Kiwi Cafe. This place lets you order food that you can take on the go. You have your classic Maxim tomato and energy drink, but you also have the Kirby burger and the caramel cake, which became part of the menu of Kirby Cafe. So if you're like me and really want to go to Kirby Cafe but can't because you don't live in Japan, then you can kinda accomplish that dream. You can also eat it right there and see a cute cutscene. Aside from cuteness, we can also play a mini game, Wildly Cafe Help Wanted. You need to give the Wild D what they want as fast as possible. After a while, lunch rush time will begin and the Wild D will come faster. The last level of Frenzy Gate will really make you feel like you're working at a McDonald's. This is a lot in the menu and the people get angry at you for waiting 3 seconds. Really weird that keep it going for more mature tones. Anyway, the minigame is fun. Finally, we have Wise Water D. Keep to some random stats like how many enemies you kill, how many jumps you did, stuff like that. But most importantly, he tells you if you miss any blueprints, which is very useful since the game doesn't tell you otherwise. And that's basically everything you can do at the moment, so let's return to the map. This next world is amazing. Won't areas remain? While I like the approach of the worst taking old teams and making them fit in this new world, I do like something more wacky from time to time. And what's more wacky than an amusement park? This is Wonderia. Or at least, the remains. Keeping with the post about collective theme, this world may be full of fun rides, popcorn and great music, but there is still this looming sadness all over it. Everything is empty, with a later level choking some of that spooky sad. But why get ahead of yourself? Let's enjoy this place. Welcome to Wonderia. From the very first screen, we can see why this level is so great. It's the entrance of an amusement park. You got this huge statue of the mascots. You can take a photo with Elflin, and more importantly, you help dogs get to their mother. The next screen shows the current state of the park. The rides are going crazy, flowers started to bloom, there's mud everywhere. And did you know ice can skate over the mud? See, ice is not that bad. Most importantly, who the f are you? You can just give Hammer like it's nothing, that's illegal. Hammer has always been a bonkers exclusive ability, but since this game has so few of those, they made an enemy that gives you hammer. I really like the ability, so it doesn't bother me, but it still feels wrong. But hey, at least that gives us a free BI pass to skip the line and try out the newest mouth mode, Custer Mouse. Now you are the roller coast. This one is pretty simple gameplay wise. You only need to tilt the control stick to make Kirby move his head left or right. It's not groundbreaking, but it's an incredible set piece, and it's also fun to get out the collectibles in one try. And if you miss, you can try again. That right there is good game design. Some more platforming and popcorn eating later, we arrive at an annoying new mouth of mobility, Water Balloon Mouth. 
With this Mafu mode, you can shoot water and enemies and terrain. It's like Mario Sunshine, but if it wasn't a good game. Also, look at that boy. He's so cute. I love the way he wiggles and bounces everywhere, and also let us get a new blueprint from Hammer. And speaking of Hammer, this is your reminder that you can do this. Fantastic! The blueprint we got is for Toy Hammer. This evolution makes the hammer an adorable toy hammer. But don't let those cute sound effects fool you, this hammer is way faster and bigger than the original. While it's not super different, it's in the same category as something like Noble Ranger. This doesn't change the way you look at the ability, but it makes it a lot faster and speed is always fun. And hey, would you look at that, the next level is all about speed. Circuit Speedway. There are some sections that take advantage of the bomb, which is pretty fun, and also you get a new blueprint for Sword, which we'll talk about in a second. But the main appeal are the racing sections with Carmel. And yes, they are amazing. Not much to say about this one, it's just a super fun level that takes advantage of how cool Carmel controls, with some far shortcuts and some nice set pieces. Going back to that blueprint, this is Giant Sword. Main arrow is to Wild Edge. This turns your tiny baby sword into a huge blade, doing massive damage at the expense of some precious speed. Take that, Link. I always go back and forth with this evolution, in one hand that sword is pretty big, but in the other it does make sword a little less fun to use. Overall, not a big fan of this one. Invasion at House of Horrors This devil takes place in a spooky attraction, but because of how it was abandoned, now ghosts loom the place. And wow, you look at that, those are the guys from Triple Deluxe. I don't usually mention enemies, but it's cool to see these ghostly menes come back. I thought we would never see them again. I'm totally down if they are not the default ghost enemies of the series, like the Boos in Mario or the Boos in Sonic. Wait, are they really the same name? Huh? Just notice that. Weird. Way better than boobs. Back to Kirby. The first part of the level is the more fun side, the place where people would go to if it was an actual attraction at a park. But then the second part is the more scary section, using a new mode for more ability called Light Bulb Mount. Kirby enters the darkness, occasionally flashing light to show the path forward or to charge some panels. He's not scary in the slightest, but I mean just look at how goofy Kirby looks with the loud mode. But I can't see the intention. The dark paths, the corridor goes that shade you, you get too close with the light on, the music being a creepy distorted version of the main theme, or it doesn't make you scream or cry or piss your pants, it still delivers in the message, the atmosphere, the world building that it tries to create. In other words, I like this section. After that, we are back to the ghostly shenanigans with a special print from Bainit Mouth. We also get a very special blueprint. Overall, another great level. But what is that special blueprint, you might ask? Well, it's not in that time crash, of course. Time crash stops the flow of time and makes Kirby explode everything he touches. The more enemy you touch, the longer the effect goes. I'm surprised they gave Crash an evolution, and they picked the best one. Crash was always fun to use, but being so limited makes it less appealing. Time crash, on the other hand, is a blast. Chaining enemies or exploding mini bosses have never felt this good. The Wandaria Dream Parade. We exit the creepy attraction to enter the back door, then open the gate to reveal the darkest secrets of the park. A beautiful robot parade. Oh, this is some Mega Man shit here. This level is all about avoiding the unstoppable robots circling the park, taking care of some little duckies, and looking at the beautiful lights. And honestly, this has to be one of the best showcases of how good this game looks like. Seriously, this looks amazing. Sure, it's not exactly a full 4K ray tracing RTX 9999 game, but Hal sure knows how to make use of the few pixels they have. And speaking of Hal, if you enter this secret room, you can actually see the second Hal room. Just wait on the racetrack until it says 86 on the timer, then cross the finish line once it appears, and ta da! New Hal room unlocked. You know, there's actually a little bit of a fun fact behind this Hal room because the reason you have to wait 86 seconds to get this to appear in a ton of games, actually, is because the Japanese pronunciation of Hal can be separated into 8 and 6. Sorry, that was my inner Kirby iceberg guy coming back in again, my bad. After this, we get some pretty fun balloon mouth puzzles that make excellent use of the mouthful mode transformation, and it lets us discover a blueprint. As we move along during this middle part of the game, all the mechanics are introduced and developed, so there's not exactly much to talk about besides this level is super fun. Which is not a problem with the game, of course, that's simply how most games are, you know what, that's fine by me. With that out of the way, we can talk about our brand new blueprint, Flor Tornado. Based on the new mid-boss Florina, this is a bigger, stronger, and faster, and sexier version of the normal Tornado, and it's a simple upgrade, but Tornado doesn't exactly have anything wrong with it, so I'll give it a pass. This new evolution also lets us play the Treasure Road of said evolution, which I swear this is a Dream Course reference. Look at this layout and tell me this is not a Dream Course reference. For some reason, no Kirby Wiki or fan site has mentioned this in an Easter Eggs video or a post or anything, but trust me, this is a Dream Course reference. They look the same! Sorry, Kirby Iceberg guy again. Alright, let's just move on to the next boss before people start calling me crazy. Danger on the big top. 
As we approach the center of the circus, we see a mysterious shadow in the center. We meet the figure, the light points at the enemy, the mysterious car that takes escape, and... Ignore that, she is Claroline, the lethal leopard. Unlike the other bosses so far, this boss may not have big attacks, but what she lacks inside, she gains the speed. Face you has her jump into one of the metal structures and has her throw a knife followed by a dive attack. After that, she will start appearing and disappearing. This is a fight that keeps you on guard in all time, and unlike the other bosses, Claroline actually has a mission that makes the fight more fun. One of the missions is to nerf throat. Do that with the no hit mission, and you have one challenging and chaotic fight. So far, the best fight in the game. Too bad it's not going to be in that spot for long. Before moving to the next world, let's once again check in with the wildies. And wow, they're really putting in work. You are a whole new part of the town, and a good friend of Kirby is waiting for us in the new arena. But first, let's check in with the weapon shell. That last boss gave us a new blueprint, and the evolution that comes from that blueprint is Pencil Drill. This evolution turns your drill into a pencil, which you can shoot after bursting from the ground. Yeah, I don't like this one that much. It doesn't deal with the problems of drills, and the little pencil projectile is hard to aim with. More than that disappointed, we unlocked a new gacha machine with some more figures. But the main point is this is the Colosseum. This is what in other Kirby games would be the arena, special mode where you can fight all the previous bosses in a row. And this one's pretty similar. Just that unlike the other games, the different arenas are divided in cups, with Forgotten Land being the first game to unlock the arena before ending the main story, which leaves it at the Meta Knight Cup. And gotta say, I love the presentation. The rest areas are locker rooms, the mini bosses are fought on an actual Colosseum with Wild D suspecting, and the commentator Wild D making some comments during the matches. But aside from that, it's pretty standard stuff. You fight all the bosses so far, there's a timer so you can improve your runs, hammer is broken, all is good in the world. But the final battle on the Colosseum is no other than Meta Knight. Complete with him offering you a sword for a clean duel, which you can see if you're an idiot like me. But pick the sword or not, the battle starts, and. Folks, I'm not going to restrain myself. This is the best Kirby song ever. Combining multiple Meta Knight teams with my friend and the setting song being the main melody, this song is so intense yet precise. It's the perfect feeling for a sword duel, but you and Meta Knight are on full control at all times. Meta Knight attacks you swiftly and fast, but you can be brave and dodge all his face. The battle gets more and more intense, but the music cannot get better, right? This is it! This is so fing good! Best song in the game, best song in the series, already decided, this is the new outro, and the best part is that this boss is the best one so far! The amount of attacks Meta Knight throws at you from familiar moves to completely new ones, he's not fing around! Meta Knight takes the 3D aspect and narrates his already perfect boss fights from the past to the next level. When I first played this game, I was shocked at how good it was, but it gets even better! Meta Knight had this attack that if you get hit by he does a cinematic version of the upper color from Starlight that looks sick. Why can't this be his final smash? But the best part is that you have sword, you can deflect the attack and start a quick time event if you success you will knock Meta Knight for a short time in which you can grab his sword, get the next evolution for sword for free, and then Meta Knight uses his classic sword from Kirby's Adventure! Again! Holy f***ing shit! I love this fight! But sadly, everything needs to end. So let's put an end to this duo. Coming down a little, why was Meta Knight here in the first place? Well, he also got sucked up by the portal with the rest of the Wild Dees. And spoiling a little, Meta Knight found Wild Dees and protected the town while Kirby was out rescuing Wild Dees from the Beast Pack. 
which means that it was only a friendly duel to test if Kirby can survive in this new world. A later figure it also tells that he had to fight Gorimondo 30 times and that he won every fight. If there's anyone that can prepare Kirby, it's him. Meta Knight might not have a strong presence like in other Kirby games, but his appearance in this game is still amazing. And what's more, after defeating him we get one of the best evolutions in the game, Meta Knight Sword. Not only it's a faster and stronger version of normal swords or no slow BS like with Giant Sword, but if you are full health you will shoot crescent shots, and the sword combo becomes a mini version of Upper Calibur. If Sword was one of my favorites in the game, now it certainly is my favorite. I think we have spent long enough this visit, let's move on to the next world. Winter Horns The Ice World of the game I personally love Ice World. I find them so cozy and relaxing so they are always a highlight for me. I know a lot of people don't like them but this one doesn't disappoint. Taking more from natural planes, this world accommodates the usual Ice Worlds to fit in the post-apocalyptic setting, making the world more unique than it sounds on paper. I would say that this is the world, aside from Wonderia, that feels the most real, but for that we need to look at the actual levels. Northeast Frost Street even from the very start with the Warp Star, we can see how this level blends classic ice and snow trophies and mixes them in with the new world. And I gotta say, this music, after the excitement that was sort of a surviving guardian, ah, this song is so beautiful, relaxing yet emotional. But then... Did I mention I love this soundtrack? I probably did. Still, I love this soundtrack. And I'll probably say it like 10 more times, so get used to it. I mean, seriously, how can a song that's related to a cold level bring so much heat? The level itself is pretty good. Since we are getting to the part of the game where the player already knows what abilities do what, the game just throws at you like 50 enemies with different abilities. Like, like seriously, I'm, I'm serious. The first four enemies have Ranger, Ice, Cutter, and Cutter. And not to mention it also takes advantage of some mouthful mode abilities like Venting and Stairs adding to the already mentioned amazing music and stunning visuals you have a level that leaves a huge impression. After a little shout out to this chain bomb treasure roads, which reminds me that bombs also have floaties. That's so cute! Oh my god! What if I touch it? I actually, no, I, I shouldn't do that. Anyway, let's move on to the next level. Metro Nice. Yeah, I know how much you say on this one, it's just another phenomenal level, especially thanks to the aesthetics of a metro turning into ice cave. These are some pretty fun secrets, but if that wasn't enough, I mean it has Crash, a Hammer and an Invincibility Candy section, so you can't go wrong with that. It's also famous for being the absolute worst use for Drill. They give you this ability right at the end and you can't use its main purpose which is to dig because everything is metal. And it's also an elevator, so good luck avoiding the bulbs. Windy Freezing Sea Just like the name of the level suggests, this level is all about wind. Being as an obstacle or as a tool, what I was more impressed by was the two mouthful modes that were used. We get a return on the ring mount which fits perfectly with the wind gimmick of the stage, but we also have scissor leaf mount, which actually had fun puzzles with cannons and this ending with the wind. Another thing I liked was getting another blueprint, the new and final evolution of fire is dragon fire. Which not only gives Kirby a really cool hat, but also makes the fire speed go super far and makes the burn dash attack go for like an hour with an amazing dragon wind effect. Again, it doesn't fundamentally change fire, but just simply makes it better and more fun. The Battle of Blizzard Bridge The mini boss rush of the game. These type of levels are all staple of Kirby games, but I always found them a little unnecessary. Not bad, but I would not want them to be an actual level. Well, it seems hard listen to me because after every battle, there's a small challenge with the ability of the boss in question. Return of the Iron also has something like that, but the bosses were too easy. Plus, we now have missions, which makes it more challenging. Except, fuck this mission in particular. Usually, missions are in order, so if you miss the second one, you know where it could be. But this mission is at the end. But the Maxing Tomato is right at the beginning. And this is a boss rush level. I had to fight every boss like five times before I gave up and look at the guy just to realize my mistake. And this is Maxing Tomato hints at another, another staple of these type of levels. A secret pattern with harder bosses. And this level is no different. Since this game has so few mini-bosses, it just throws two of the same mini-bosses at once. Which some 3D games also did, but thanks to the third dimension, these fights are actually fun. Also, we get a new blueprint from Ice. That's right, Fire and Sword are already on the third evolution and Ice is just now getting one. This is Frosty Ice, based on Frosty. This evolution leaves Frosty snowman in the ground which you can then split them with ice to make them bigger and then kick them to enemies. Which sounds like an interesting upgrade that could change how you play with this ability just like Bomb did. 
But once you actually start using them, you realize just how pathetic this no man are. Not only do you need to make them grow, which is low if you want to use multiple, they also do beautiful damage. It doesn't change the way you play, I see still boring, slow and weak. And to think guys was one of my favorites in the 2D games. Anyways, fun fact that I forgot to mention, one of the missions in the last level was to take off 5 wanted Effley posters. Keep that in mind. An unexpected beast king. From the moment the level starts, the atmosphere is unrivaled. The cold winds, the cages on the ground, and the gigantic church. This is no ordinary boss fight. As we approach a mysterious familiar figure, we see commanding some birds from the beast pack to take a wild deer away. The music starts as he turns around and... Got the med hall, please pick a design. King Diddy, his royal nemesis. I did it with Meta Knight, so it's fair to do it with Diddy. Holy fucking sh! This song is so good! They took the already amazing Diddy thing with some parts added from the stylized version, they just made it raw as fuck! Every single note hits like a train, and if that wasn't enough, Diddy screaming is part of the song and it's amazing! I prefer Sort of a Surviving Guardian more, and I think people overhype this song a tiny bit, but I can't blame them. Roro Diddy is an amazing song as in a heavy contestant for the best song in the game. And the fight itself doesn't disappoint. We already saw what a Diddy fight in 3D can look like with Blood Blast. And while the first fight is pretty similar to that fight, the way the camera moves and shakes when Diddy attacks made the fight feel fresh. But the true highlight is the second phase. Diddy says, Fuck this hammer, which you can inhale, by the way, a cute detail, and grabs a whole pillar and uses to smash the ground, creating ice packs. He also swings it to hit you in different ways that keeps some move from phase 1 like the Super DDD gem. I wish he had one or two more moves, but otherwise an amazing fight. With the DDD yet again being possessed, but now that we defeated him, he'll probably snap at it at any second. Plus, we got a new blueprint. What can go wrong? Oh, we're f***. DDD still possessed, he captured everything, give his sad which should make me sad, Everything went wrong, but don't worry buddy, I will rescue you, no matter how far or how hard is the journey, I will bring you back. Right after this fishing mini game, let's go baby, give me that big boy. Before we can talk about the best suspect of the game, let's talk about that new evolution we got in the boss fight. This is Humming Bomb, and yet again Bomb gets one of the best evolutions that completely changes how you use the ability. Just like the name implies, your bombs now become homing bombs that go around chasing enemies until they explode on contact. What is more interesting that it still keeps the chain bomb property, which means that you can create more powerful chains way more easily and faster. So now you have to decide what to focus on. Do you just want to spam and let the bombs go on their way, or do you want to be a little slower to make bigger explosions? Either one has their issues, bombs on their own are weak, and bombs run away too fast for slow planning. Only a balance act between the two places will give you the best use for this ability. It's so insane that Bomb of all abilities got such a crazy evolution. Moving to World Detail in itself, we have our final main sound expansion. There are still some secrets left to discover, but for now, this is our last big stop. Starting with the smallest thing, we have a new shop, World Design Shop. In this store, we can buy some temporary power-ups. Life up doubles your health, attack boost increases your attack power for 200 seconds, and speed boost lets you run faster for also 200 seconds. You can buy and store these items and use them at any time, with attack and speed boost being stackable. And you can use the three boosts at once, but you can only have one in your inventory. In my opinion, they make some later parts way too easy, but it's completely optional. So for people like me, they don't matter. While having some more inexperienced gamers. Overall, a good job. Moving on to Big Fiction, we have Flash Fishing. It seems Big the Cat finally has some competition. In this minigame, you have to wait for a blipper to bite and then press the correct buttons. It gets harder towards the end, with the gold blipper timer being really tight. But it doesn't get more complex than that. It's just a fun side activity, barely scratching the subgame category. What definitely counts as a subgame is the infamous Tilt and Roll Kirby. Being a fan reference to Kirby Tilt and Tumble for the Game Boy Color. Just like in that game, you tilt the controller, or the console if you're playing in handheld, to guide Kirby reach the goal. The first two levels are there to introduce you to the mechanics. You can immediately notice that unlike every other game in this console, they showcase the HD RAM of the Switch very well. But most importantly, it's both fun and easy. It's the third level when the problems start to show up. For one, Kirby loves to fall down, it's like there's a magnet connected to the every single pitfall. The other one being that you can tilt down easily, but you are very restricted in tilting up. But thankfully there are walls that help you on that final part, making it not that bad. 
and hey, we got the view in, it was pretty hard for sure, but I didn't see what was so bad about it. There is a harder difficulty, with insta-kill Gordos, with less walls, with time trials. Yeah, I get it. Fuck this minigame, it's really hard to explain why it's so hard, it's just really hard. I don't think it's the hardest thing in Kirby, getting platinum on the secret path from Robla still takes that title for me, but this is really close to the top. And it's not like one of those people that doesn't like motion controls. I grew up with the Wii, I was out here shaking, tilting and moving my women like there was no tomorrow. We should be a sign for how terrible this is. Definitely you only need to do the normal levels for 100% completion, wish I knew that before. But if you want to be in the cool kids table, then prepare to suffer. Well, that was a fun visit to Wild Town. Wait, didn't we have to say someone? Original Wasteland. Following the path of the previous wars, Original Wasteland is a twist to the usual sand level from previous Kirby games. This time it's a dried up ocean that became a desert with the passage of time, but as we go further in the levels we can see some hints to civilization. It really makes you think of how old these ruins are. Also, not gonna die, but this gives me strong gigabyte grounds for robot vibes. You know, with all the mesh of technology and desert, the levels do get a lot more creative further, but it goes to show the problems reusing the same level aesthetics in every game. You can't be original every time. But let's just move on, shall we? The ways when life began. Jesus Christ, what a title. The first part of this level is actually quite interesting. While the whole game goes for a more linear type of 3 platforming akin to Super Mario 3D World, this screen shows a little bit more of what a more open-ended 3D sandbox Kirby game can be like with us having a big area to run around collecting items for wildies, finding secrets and fighting optional mini bosses. what's more, every mission on this stage is on this one area. There's even another ability blueprint. The level is still designed around a clear main path, but it's still a section I can look back and admire. I understand why how went the route they went with this game, and as you can clearly see in this video, I love this game. But maybe the next one can improve on this mode concept and make a game more similar to Mario Odyssey or 64. Now that would be big fiction. The rest of the level is pretty standard, with the standard part being this challenge where you actually have to do platforming this platformer. What a concept. Also, there's a neat secret here right at the end that gave you some good if you managed to get all the green star pieces. A little bit of clever background story telling is that this secret area, and the whole ending part for that matter, actually takes place at the doors of a deserted oasis hotel. And guess what level is next? But right before that, there is a new ability evolution that we just unlocked. Crystal Needle. The final evolution of the needle doesn't really change much from the previous evolution. It's faster, it lasts longer, it throws crystal balls, and now it leaves some spike crystals on the ground while rolling. Not the most groundbreaking of evolution, it just makes Nino even more fun than before. And honestly, that's all I could ever ask. Searching the oasis. As we saw in the last level, this level takes place inside the oasis. And if that sounds really cool, it's because it is. I really like the levels where they feel like real places, without sacrificing the more platform inside. I already mentioned how much I love a level mode and North is frosted. I don't have one area, but I'm still impressed with how well they managed to do it here. There are pools everywhere, you can see balconies in the distance, beach umbrellas, plants for decoration, all leading to a perfect atmosphere that clashes with the poison and the sand, again showing that subtle storytelling of an ancient civilization. But how can I forget about my personal favorite mission in the game? Taking a nap by the secret pool. Incredible. The actual level itself is pretty fun. They brought back my boy Totenga from Return to Dreamland, which was a nice surprise. There are also big poison frogs that you have to avoid. There are some really neat secrets to find, including yet another blueprints. Even Drill got another moment to shine. But my two big healers were the pipe and watermelon section. We are far from War T, so it's not to see these two get more fun segments. Before moving to the next level, I do have to say two things. First, f this treasure road, f this treasure road, f this treasure road, f this treasure road. And second, a new cutter blueprint. The final version of this ability is Bossa Cutter, and oh my god, this is insanely fun. Its main gimmick is that if the Bossa hits a wall, it will bounce off, which means that you can be smart about the bounces to maximize damage or to do puzzles. Or kill everything inside! Ahem, <clears throat> Alive Mode, Stuff Side. Mix Alive Mode with the incredible clashing atmosphere of the previous level, and you have this incredible level. Starting off with one of the most beautiful shots in the entire game, once you enter the mode, you will clearly notice the main gimmick of this level. While the main part of the mall is still bright and cheerful despite the ruins, going to the staff side shows a more sinister and deadly side. Even the music changes. From a level design perspective, it's not as like expansive as the original album mode, but what it does have is some very clever use for mouth mode. Instead of using the ability each mouth mode have, this level has you constantly searching for a specific item to fit into the conveniently shaped holes throughout the stage. 
and the tight corridors make sure you have to deal more with the enemies and traps on your way to your destination. Various times using the two different sides to interact with the stage. I still think overall the first alive mode was better, but this was still so much fun to go through. Also blueprint, woo! I'm running out of ways to integrate the blueprints into the script, help me! Here we have wild hammer. It's a big, slow, but powerful hammer. That's pretty much it. Kinda disappointing since Toy Hammer was such a unique spin on the iconic ability. But oh well, Moonlight Canyon. While being more generic than the other three levels in this world, Moonlight Canyon is probably one of the most dynamic stages in the whole game. It starts with a small canyon clan where you can find another blueprint, then you enter a dark cave when you have to once again use light bulb mouth to light up the path, which I have to admit is not as dark as I would have liked with multiple light sources everywhere, making the mouth of mode kinda useless. But then you come out of the cave, the doors open, and then... Oh my god. I already said it like a million times before, but I will keep doing it. The soundtrack of this game is amazing, and this song stands out in the entire OST. It's so climatic and powerful, but also soothing and delightful with that guitar. It's so good. And the level itself complements the song perfectly. You're high in the mountains, platforming unbreakable blocks, avoiding fire cannons, all with a beautiful night sky in the background. Cecil leaves Mauricate his own secret room, including a little reference to that one room from Superstar with his sleep ability and obstacles. And if that wasn't enough, the level changes again with an arch mount section gliding through what once was an ocean, but now has turned into a dangerous ravine. Despite being the only stage in the world that doesn't have a unique gimmick, they managed to create such a fun level. You know what else is fun? Checking out this new blueprint. Oh, never mind, it's twin drill. Okay, it's a fine enough ability evolution that gives Ryu some much needed speed and power, and it gives it this cool saw when on the ground. But really? Two drills? That's the best thing you got? Whatever, let's move on to the boss. Collector in the Sleepless Valley. In the midst of a dark cave, we found an underground hideout filled with stuff from Wanderia. Statues, signs, and presents sinking in the sand. A combination of spooky and cozy. Moving along, we see tons of anti Kirby signs. Further expansion lead us to a flat area with a cage containing. Elphilin? Is that really you? Yes, kidding! It's the armor plater prance! It's silly Dillo time! I love this guy, he's so silly. And Dillo. We start the fight in a very small room with Dutch Sea Dillo's one and only attack in this base. But while this part is not very good boss wise, I really appreciate the small storytelling here. Soon as who's behind the cages, anti Kirby posters, and other creation by the Beast Pack. You can even hit the handmade Kirby's for a mission. But after a few hits, Silly Dillo destroys the ground and we start the real fight. And by real fight, I mean spin. The next two phases have Silly Dillo in a semi invincible rolling state where Kirby needs to dodge until a small opening shows up. The attack themselves are not hard to dodge, the challenge comes more for finding when to attack him. At first, I found this fight very wacky and fun. Especially when he decided to throw his dance partner in the mix, that one gave me a nice chuckle. But unless you get a long range or a very strong ability, this fight can become pivot too. Where you are endlessly waiting to attack, you do some cheap damage and you're back to waiting. And with Silly Dillo only having about 3 attacks in total, it can get very repetitive, so I get why people didn't like this fight. Still, I mean look at him, it's impossible to hit him. But you know what I can hate? This new blueprint! Let's go back once more to Wild Detail to explain why. Remember all my b****ing about Frosty Eyes? Well, take a look at Blizzard Eyes! Not only is it 10 times less original and funny than Frosty Eyes, but the new addition to this already disappointing ability are that now instead of cute summon you leave big spiky eyes, with your dash and guard also getting some spikes. And that's it! Same problems as before, it still lacks the mobility from its 2D counterpart, it's still weak compared to other evolutions, and it's still a whole attack to win. Yeah, I don't like eyes in this game, if you couldn't tell. And then we have some more gambling! That's about it, moving on! Red card for Vivian Lands. At long last, we arrive at the last main world of this game. Everything has led up to this moment, and I'm not really vibing with it. This is my opinion when they stop trying to aim for that balance between a semi-realistic post-apocalyptic world and funny cartoony level tropes. When people say Forgotten keeps reusing the same old aesthetics, this is the only word that comes to mind. Not saying it's completely unoriginal, and as we'll soon see, there is still some crazy stuff in these levels, but I really feel like they wanted to make a lava war and try to draw in the remains of a city. Which is also not the most original idea. Sonic 06 would really crash the cities, and we say that game did a better job of a burning city level. But enough complaining, let's get going. 
enter the fiery forbidden lands. After all that trash I just talked, I need to keep close to this opening. Teams like Triple Deluxe, Plan Robot, and Star Allies had us infiltrate the enemy territory, leading to some pretty cool atmosphere that perfectly represent the enemy team. Forgotten Land still keeps that tradition, but as we can see, the enemy base is very basic to say the least. Only wooden structures everywhere, be very basic strategic positions, and I kinda love that. The Beast Pack are still just animals, they don't have access to incredible technology like the Jambashans, they don't have a strict military like Sectonia, they are just basically working like early human civilization, using the environment to their advantage, and this first part of the level shows that aspect of their character perfectly. The level itself is okay I guess, I really like how much used real god and some secrets were pretty well hidden, but aside from that, it sure is a lava level. Conquer the Inferno Road. Ok, this is a pretty fun level. The first part has a climb up a skyscraper, while the second part has probably the only good use of ice in the main game, ending with some ring bound action on land and on lava? Ok, again, fun level, but aside from this ranger blue that's really well hidden, there's not much to talk about. But what there is to talk about is that pretty mentioned blueprint. Here we have Space Ranger. From what I've seen, people seem to really like this one. Unlike Noble Ranger, this evolution goes back to the single shot of Normal Ranger, but with one major difference. Yeah, sometimes a big blast is all you need. That and the really cute hat, burning, churning power plant. Ah, a good old factory level, keep it so great at those. And this one doesn't disappoint, as your typical trolls from this kind of level are here, but improved with the 3D aspect, like moving walls that will crash you if you don't find a place to hide, or pistons with conveyor belts underneath to mess up your movement. An overall great level that sadly loses point for being a little bit on the short side. This level does have two pretty cool secrets, the first one being a well hidden blueprint for… sleep? That's right, even sleep gets some love. Here we have deep sleep. Not only does it not for you to sleep immediately, but letting you choose when to sleep, but also greatly replenishes health and even gives you a free random power up. And I remember people praising squid for when they kept sleep and ability scroll to heal yourself. That is nothing compared to the ultra chat deep sleep. In a perfect world, sleep would actually have a moveset like in Battle Royale, but this is the next best thing. I did mention two secrets, so what's the other one? Well, if you enter the secret room, then head back to the start of the level, climb up some pipes, and exit the vents, you will find another hall room. This time featuring an 8 bit version of the Switch melee from the other hall rooms. It's always a treat to find these rooms, and they serve as a good reminder of how much this company does for its games. Gathering of the Beast Console Man, the game is making it pretty difficult to talk about these last few levels, ain't it? As the name might imply, this level is quite different from the others. The main gimmick here is that we have a boss rush of all three previous Beast Pack console members, those being Gorimondo, Claroline, and Silly Dilo. Reminder that Tropic Woods is not part of the Beast Pack. And while that sounds sort of lame, at least we have some fun sections in between the bosses with some muffled most abilities that aren't as utilized as the others. Plus, there's some cool secrets to find that makes otherwise a filler level into another fun ride. Most importantly, here we find the last hidden blueprint of the game. We have the final evolution of Tornado, Storm Tornado. Fluent the mentality of Space Ranger, Storm Tornado takes the original ability and makes it way stronger, faster, and flashier. This time going for, well, a storm. So I have the same feelings as the Ranger Evolution, while it doesn't really change much, I still really like it. The Beast Pack's final stand. Unlike in every other world, we have a fit level to play in, and this one is a gauntlet. I'm talking a ton of enemies, platforming all around, and a final showing of almost every single map from all ability. Avoiding lava rock with scissor mouth, fighting poison crocs with water balloon, hitting metal blocks with bending machine to unlock stairs and use that to exit a wild bee, avoiding the whirlpools with a ring, flying through the metal grounds and ending with cone to crush this huge turtle. Even storage mode got an appearance here. To this piece of a video, I've been sharing my thoughts about the different mouth mode abilities that exist in this game. But I never once stopped and talked about mouth mode as a whole, and that's because it's not that big of a deal. Unlike the other big gimmicks like super abilities and the robot, Mouth of Mode is sorta of lame. It doesn't have a big animation, it doesn't crush everything in spot, and in some instances it actually used to hinder the player. I mean just look at this final level and compare it to other similar types of level. And that's because Mouth of Mode was never meant to be the big gimmick of the game. And that's what makes it so special. 
Aside from a few abilities like Roller Caution and Tube, every other transformation doesn't put the focus on themselves, but rather they use the unique characteristic of each ability to enhance the level. This video has made me see the light of how smart Hal was when deciding when to play each mouth for more ability. Would I like to get something a little bit more fancy? Yes, but we also need to remember that this is Kirby's first real attempt at 3D platforming. So having the main gimmick complement the level design, and by extension, the 3D aspect, is a great choice. So yeah, Mothumor is not perfect by any means, and I missed the spark of the previous game, but I feel like it was a necessary choice to make this game even more fun than it is. So in that matter, Mouth of Mode is a complete success. In the presence of the king. No more long introduction, only one last elevator is the only thing that stands between us and our longtime rival. This fight will decide every... Uh, are you okay there, DDD? You seem like you need some... Hey, oh my god, he has two hammers. It seems the DDD we once knew is long gone. Now there's only the primal nemesis. Forgo DDD. While the first fight doesn't have much health, it functions as a harder and more capable DDD. Quick swings, launching his hammer to make fire pillars spin across the arena, all makes for a great yet not long lasting fight. But all that changes once the first health pad is gone. Jesus Christ, he's going feral! As an incredible remix of Mass DDD plays in the background, everything has gone to sh. Diddy starts running out four, and the fight becomes even more intense and fast than before. He tries to dash into you, launches more fire pillars, the DDD jump leaves lava holes on the ground. At some point, he even calls for informants to attack you. To say that this fight took me by surprise would be an understatement. But one final hit, and we save our friend. We save the world this, and everything is right in the world. Don't worry, DDD, you just got possessed. They will go Friday, am I right? It seemed to be Spike didn't like that though, so a whole horde of enemies rushed towards us, and there's only one escape route. So we all ran towards the elevator, and god damn it, Waddle D. Then, in one of his greatest moments yet, he didn't know his fallen ally and decides there is no time left for the both of them. So he tosses the wild into the elevator and faces off against everyone alone. I love this moment. This redemption has always been a big part of the oral story of the Kiwi series, but sadly almost never gets the attention it deserves. So to finally see Diddy do something big to show that character growth, it's an incredible feeling. But no time to dwell on the past. As the elevator gates closes, we enter something much, much sinister. Lab Discover. Automatic language detection activated. What the f do you mean there's voice acting? And it's in every language too. Talk about production value. But anyway, back to the plot. The automated post recording tells us what this whole place is all about. This is a lab meant to contain and analyze the ultimate life form. Shadow the I mean IDWF86. Through analysis, they managed to develop planetary work with technology. But 30 years of the analysis. I get it like this game be made for the 30th anniversary of the series. Hey 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 hey. IDF86 separated into two beings, with one of them managing to escape. Since then, the other half has been trapped in what the boys calls the Eternal Capsule. And the reason of the kidna while this being that they are forced to run on a hamster wheel to power the lab. Kinda messed up. And here we are. One scary hallway later, we meet face to face with said ultimate life form. Behind, the leader of the beast. The lion tells the tale of how the people of this world used IDF 86 power to leave behind the forgotten land. Beast pack included, and enter a land of dreams. Hmm, I wonder where I heard that before. With the beast pack we all been to reunite the two halves and reawaken this power, telling us that our friend Evelyn was the missing half all along. Well, he's technically not evil, so that's good to know, but that means if we want to save our friend, we have to go through him first. King of the Beast, Leon Gar. The fight places a more aggressive Gorimondo. And I don't know man, but like, this fight didn't really hit for me. Every other boss got something to call their own. Different strategies to defeat them, different movement speed, different ways to interact with them. But Leon Gar is just a simple boss. You're not bad by any means. The music is so raw. Phase 2 got some really cool attacks and you could say Leon Gar is a fusion of all the previous Beast Pack bosses. Which sounds really cool in concept, but in actuality it's nothing more than a structure for what's to come. 
So we're still feeling and funny, everything's right in the world, son of a bitch. So the other half IDF86 gets mad at us, breaks his containment and starts Oh, oh god, oh, oh, oh god, oh what, what, oh, what is happening? So we managed to escape from there, but not for long as the invasive species, Fecto Forgo is here, and j Jesus Christ, I, I can't take this, oh the sound it makes it, oh it's chasing us and god, you can see the enemies merging with one another, no one told me it was a horror game, oh and now F is captured again, great, I guess we'll try to find him, reaching the top of the building we find our objective, now in his completed form. This is the ultimate life form. Fecto Elfis. And boy, where do I start? Take the dynamic speed of Merlite, the power of Leon Guard, add incredible cinematic shots, hit them like a million different attacks, and you get Fecto Elfis. This is an insane fight. Fecto Elfilis constantly transitions between her moves, switching from air projectiles to ground strikes, sometimes combining the two, and sometimes he can just fake you out just to f with you. You have to be on your toes at all time, and I love that. While the bosses of this game are all still fun, Fecto Elfilis and Meta Knight take the most advantage of the third dimension, doing things that can be done with a simple 2D plane, attacks from come all ways, having to move all around the area to dodge some attacks and my god all the camera angles. It makes every attack feel that much more powerful, not to mention the beautiful setting we are, feeling both warm, intensive and dangerous. And how can I not mention the sublime music? It's so complex yet simple, so calm yet moving, so beautiful yet so horrifying. It took me some time to appreciate his song, but once you listen to it enough and understand what makes it so unique compared to other Final Boss teams, it's a song that has no comparison in the series. And once we deal enough damage to the boss to enter phase 2, one of 14 different transitions will play depending on what part is playing when you enter the second phase. And the song that follows... The fight itself also pits up, minions falling, more attacks coming our way, this stupid healing move that got me on my first run, this fight is far from over, but after struggling to survive, we land one final hit, the only thing left to get Elfin in with, don't mount, which choice is a last mount for more ability, but okay. So we rescue Elfin, Perfecto still has fight in him. So in a desperation move he summons Popstar? How on earth am we supposed to- Oh, that's convenient. Tomb Mount is not the last mouth for more. There's one final ability that we haven't seen until now. Big Rick Mouth. So we fire up the truck gun. Is that an extended version of the invincibility team? That's so cool. But we can't focus on that right now. Look around us, we are racing through skyscraper, destroying every enemy in our path, and we see parts of Popstar and Dreamland fall through the portals, crashing into a road. This is one of the greatest fun moments in the Gibby series. But it is missing one thing. And there it is, Machine. Using Elfling's power, spinning the stick just like in the last 4 games, and the power of a screaming Kirby, we push on for one final attack. Despite our best effort, Factor V's final attack continues, sucking everything in Popstar. There is little we can do. Elfilis. Don't you dare! Don't do this to my heart!
with one final sacrifice, the day is saved. Kyrie and the Forgotten Land comes to his... Nah, just kidding, it's fine. This whole final section was incredible, from the scary elevator scene to all the lore dumping to all that gross hallway chase, the final boss has an outstanding atmosphere and that final mouth of mobility was so insanely high. So you really had to revive Elfie that fast? You really couldn't let the moment play for a few minutes? It was such a touching scene at first, but he just comes only 20 seconds later. I get how not wanting to kill the characters to feature him more in the future, Cough Cough, Marx and Magolor, but I think this could have been handled way better. We'll get to the post game in a second here, but imagine instead of saving Leon Garso, we save Elphilin. We have a way strong connection to him than Leon, that would make so Elphilin can live while not completely ruin this moment. But fine, let's move on. This is a Kirby game, so of course it's going to be a post game. Let's talk about it before I get more mad. After a cute credit scene where we can see the beast pack peacefully hanging out with everyone, we come back to Waddle Dee Town to check on what's new. There's a new volume for the gacha machine with some really cool figurines to collect. We also unlock the sound test, but instead of being boring, here it's contextualized as a band of Waddle Dee's called The Deadly Dees. You can also give them money to upgrade their stage and unlock more music. Name a better way to contextualize sound test? You can't. We can also check on DDD. He's doing the pose! And he gives you a cool blueprint from Hammer. Here we have Mask Hammer. Now I know why Wild Hammer was so underwhelming, it's because this evolution is crazy. Based on the Mask DDD boss from this game, we get two hammers for the price of one, offering a great attack speed. Also, every ground finishing launches two fire pillars. Every time you do this aerial stomp, launches four fire pillars. And Hammer Flip gets changed to a fire tornado attack. Now that's how you do a hammer evolution. While we are here at the weapon shop, I can also talk about how we can now upgrade the power of our abilities with some coins and rare treasures. But it's not like the ability evolution where the whole ability changes, this is to, literally, make it more powerful. And speaking of being powerful, you need power to beat the newest cup at the Colosseum, the Ultimate Cup. This is just the arena with a fancy name. Following more, the South Superstar returns to Dinhan with random opponents until the end where the last few are predetermined. But aside from that, it's nothing special, so let's move on to the main attraction of the post game. It seems Caroline found a clue as to where Leongar went, but when we go talk to her, we get sucked by a portal transporting us to. Asolated House, Forgo Dreams. So, this is supposed to be a dream rail created by Fecto Elfling's memories. Or something like that, they just wanted an excuse to reuse some assets, but this is the main bulk of our post game. In contrast to other games, Forgot Dreams work pretty similar to another world, but there are some key differences. First, every level has the same banger track that surprisingly didn't get annoying. Secondly, every level works as a remixed version of the words from the base game, like for example the first level, Forgot Plains, starts off at the point of arrival, but there's a ton of more enemies and in the next screen is through the tunnel, but with different spots for secrets and so on and so forth. And in good Kirby tradition, at the end we get a more powerful version of that area's boss. The main difference is that instead of collecting one of these and doing missions, every screen has part of Leon Gar's soul, so you have to explore every inch of the level to find them. Thankfully, everything will tell you if you collect them all in the area, so if you miss one it's pretty easy to know where it is. Doesn't mean they're super easy to find though. Some are out in the open or obtain of the feeling stronger version of the mini bosses, but most of them are really well hidden or behind hard platforming sections, which puts this post game in a weird place. It's at the same time one of the best post game in a Kirby game, and also pretty underwhelming? Let me explain. In the couple past Kirby games, the main post game mode was just us going through the same game again with some other different like harder bosses or playing as another character. In one hand, this makes the post game seem pretty lazy and pointless, but at the same time makes the game more replayable. Forgotten Land's extra mode is the complete opposite. Yes, it's still reusing the base game, but the twist this time is way more interesting. Not only did they take advantage of the 3D aspect making you search all over for those soul pieces, but there are more creative uses for your abilities and mouthful mode. And now that this is supposed to be a hard mode, they don't hold back. Some highlights of great moments include the multiple uses of ice skating, really liking how much they use ice here seeing the rest of the game all forgot this ability fighting against the winning ring mount, the best section for light bulb in the entire game, this cool top down maze, cool ways of using drill, again just like with ice giving the spotlight to lesser used abilities, 
You also have this section where you use invincibility candies with different mouth and muscles to walk through the poison to feed through each hole. And the bosses. Oh my god, they're so good. Remember all the fun gimmicks and the different ways to fight each one? Well, take that and crack them to 11. Tropic Woods make it harder for you to approach, having you use his spine to dodge certain attacks. Claroline is way faster and she has more attacks that play on that trickster gimmick, with shadow clones and more teleports. Seal Dito's even more annoying with him summoning a sandstorm to obscure your view. Gurumondo and Dirity 1 don't really change much, they're just faster and more aggressive, but I still find them way more fun than their original counterparts. But for Godidity on the other hand, it's complete chaos. He's tilting the platform off, then he's much faster, he combines attacks in challenging ways, and he has a huge moveset, turning what once was a fun but underwhelming fight into one of the best DDD fights in the series. But I can't see why some people would rather have something akin to Meta Nightmare or Guest Star mode. Those modes, especially the latter one, added so much replay value. Imagine going through the game with Meta Knight or DDD collecting items in the way to speed you up, enhance your attack, or taking shortcuts. Forgo Dreams is incredible, but unless I'm starting the game from zero, once I get all the collectibles, I'm not going back. Maybe an asshole aside, if you get enough Power of Leon's Souls, we get access to the final level, Forgo Land. As we approach the lonely hall of Lab Discoverer once more, we can hear parts of the Tor dialog echoing through the void. Is this what IDF86 was hearing all those years over and over again? Aside from the clever storytelling, once we go inside the lab, we find ourselves yet again with the King of the Beast. But this time, we are not here to fight. Using Leon's soul part and Enfield's power, we finally turn this one enemy into yet another friend. Time to celebrate! And there goes Leongar again. Phase 1 of Forgo Leon is basically the same as Phase 2 of the original fight. Thankfully, once we get rid of that first health fight is when the real boss begins. Leon becomes way more aggressive, he's faster, all his attacks get stronger like his laser dropping rocks from the ceiling, his projectors require you to pay more attention, and when his health goes below half, Fecto Forgo even makes an appearance. Now you have to deal with Leon's powerful attacks while avoiding the shockwaves that Fecto Forgo leaves. Wow, this fight is much better than the first one. All of the bosses got great upgrades in the post game, but Leongar was the one that needed them more. Now he truly feels like he is a leader. He has the big moves of Corimondo, the sneakiness of Claroline, and the speed of Silidido. Then you include Fecto Forgo appearing in the second half, and you have a great send off to the Beast Pack as a whole. But you know how Kiri games go. Once you beat the final boss, there's always a soul form right around the corner. So bring it on, soul forgo, psychic beast. Why is the camera moving? Oh god. Oh no. Oh shit. Oh f not you again. No. It's impossible. We're being you stylized. You piece of. Back! Back from guest star mode in Kiri's allies, Morphonite appears at the last second to once again claim a soul and challenge us to a fight. And first of all, this song though? I wasn't really vibing with Morphonite's original team, it felt too underwhelming, it didn't have the punch of steel the knights, but leave it to Hal to fix that mistake by giving this team the biggest glow up in the universe. Same thing I can say about the fight itself. The Starlight fight wasn't the best, they did improve with Morphonite EX, but once you take all those crazy moves to the third dimension, we can really appreciate their true potential. Just like in Starlight, Morphonite takes a lot of moves from Meta Knight with their own spin. What's more interesting is the unique attacks, big fire waves that you have to find an opening and jump, four go ghosts that lock onto you, quick teleports all around the arena, the double giant sword attack gets a great update, and remember that move from Starlight that makes your friend betray you? Well, if you get hit by in this game, Intest puts you in a dizzy state where the camera gets inverted, everything starts tilting, the audio gets muffled, and Morphonite doesn't care! If I do have to complain a little, the fight is a little slower than I would have wanted. Morphonite takes a lot of time in between attacks, just standing around waiting you to attack. The trade off for that speed is that all his attacks hit different. I always recommend playing as normal giving your first try to truly appreciate the bosses. And if you're doing that here, 
You know what I mean. With the butterfly defeated, a truly not important blob comes out of it, and we get our true reward. The final, for real this time, blueprint of the game. Oh, and Leon too. Thanks to the power of friendship and a thick cut, the beast pack managed to find the remaining parts of Leon's souls, finally bringing back Leon to his senses again. A satisfying conclusion to a great post game. I especially love that this is a canon epilogue to the story instead of just a what if bullshit. Building a story around the extra content makes it so much more fun to experience, and seeing how Return on the Locks also had a great epilogue, who knows? This might be the perfect future for post games. But all things come to an end. The Beast Pack became a friend. Elflin was rescued. Tiriri, it's chilling, and everything is right in the world. That ends Kirby and the Forgotten Land. Oh yeah, the boss rush. Just like in most Kirby games, when we beat out the side content, we agree to a harder version of the boss rush with all new harder version of the bosses. In this case, we have the Ultimate Cup C. Announce the world he tries to warn us how dangerous it is. And you know, he's right. Let's see that Blueprint can help us face this challenge. The final ability evolution is Morphosaur. And my god, what a way to go out. Just like with Meta Knight Sword, we can shoot crescent shots at full health. We also have a unique teleport dodge that's really fast. We can also spam two Fectocos by holding block and attacking the ground. You can also do that DC move Morphona uses by again holding dodge and attack, this time in the air. Those last two moves took me months to find out, thanks Al for not keeping the moves set on the pause screen. And finally, if we charge your spin attack to the max level we get... A Giant Sword! Controlling just like the Giant Sword ability upgrade we had a long time ago. The difference here being that it's on a small time limit and you can shoot fire tornadoes when charging it. Neat! Oh yeah, I forgot to mention every time you hit something you heal a little. Cute little tiny detail. But in all seriousness, Morphosaur is broken. If you ever struggle with the upcoming Ultimate Cup C, just pick up some drugs, get Morphosaur, and go wow. Speaking of said cup, we have already seen most of these bosses, so roll the montage. Wait, you're new here? Not going to talk about it for long, it's just Meta Knight but slightly stronger. I guess. Kinda disappointing to be honest, seeing how little is fundamentally changed when every other Phantom fight is much better than its original version. But oh well, this was just an extra for the cup. A couple more fights later we arrive at our awaited rematch with Fact 12 list. No. I should say. Species born of chaos. Chaos Elfless. If Fecto Elfless gave you trouble with his huge moveset, then you are not ready to hear that Chaos Elfless has more than double the number of attacks on its original fight. Simple attacks now are teleported right next to you, and they can also bury the timing to mess you up. They can charge at you using portals, they have crescent shots, ground pounds that spawn tornadoes, a giant ass laser because why not? The original effect of this was great by having dynamic moves that utilized the 3D aspect perfectly and by having an incredible atmosphere. Chaos Elfling takes those aspects and pushes them to the limit, with more moves, more dynamic camera angles, more challenge, more everything. I mean, just look at the screen! How cool is this? And wanna know the craziest part? We aren't even halfway done! And here we are, the final challenge in the game, the culmination of Fecto Elfly's pain and suffering for the past way too many years. This is the true Chaos Elfless. And here we are! Chaos Elfly follows the path of many other soul bosses, Big Ball, 
great soundtrack, a lot of teleportation, same attacks, but what makes it unique is how they translate those moves to 3D, like take the classic fire charge move, they just coming from the background, chaos definitely crashes into a huge pile of debris, creating a platform for you to jump and avoid the attack, or the paint move. Instead of just chilling in a corner, you actually have to keep moving to not get hit. There's also the cutter attack, the bounce on the ground that leaves a shockwave, all moves you normally see on bosses like Marx or Void, but on the third dimension, showing that even in the final moments of the game, Kirby and the Forgotten Land will never stop reminding you what you are playing. This is a Kirby game in 3D, and don't you dare forget it! With Chaos Elfelins defeated, the remains of Ecto Forgo finally reunite with Elfelins. They are finally together again, but this time at peace. You can collect every worldly and every theory for 100%, there's also things like treasure roads or upgrading every evolution to the max, but for the purpose of this video, this ends. Kirby and the Forgotten Land. What a game, man! You would think after talking about this game for more than anyone else has in their life, I would have more to say right at the end. But somehow, even after playing this game over and over again, I still find myself incapable of describing just how great this game is. The weird part is that it's not even my favorite Kirby game. It wasn't even my game of the year. This game is still not my ideal for a Kirby 3D game. I would have wanted more abilities, a bigger moveset, more expansive levels. I would kill for a 3D sandbox Kirby game like Mario Odyssey or 64. And yet, this game is still very special to me. I spent a good part of a whole year understanding and appreciating every single element. I loved the game on my first run, but now, I understand that Kirby and the Forgotten is a masterpiece, a perfect transition to 3D. I don't care that we had to wait 30 years, because it was worth it. Every aspect of this game is polished to perfection, the level design, the pacing, the bosses, the aesthetics, it's all excellent. The story is great, the beast pack was an interesting enemy group, Muffle mode is genius, and this game is overall really fun from start to finish. But don't take it from me, I just on Twitter what people thought was the thing they liked the most in the game. And the responses? Well... I just love its polish, it's Kirby's first 3D outing, yet it translates modern 2D Kirby gameplay perfectly into the third dimension, besides that it's just fun all the way through. Getting all the while at least didn't feel like a chore at all like most collectibles for example. I love all the intricate details in the game, original wasteland being a dried up ocean, winter homes probably being the England equivalent of Kirby, just the overall atmosphere and art direction, it adds to the lore while also being a Kirby like and I just adore that. I love how lively the game is, it's so fun to explore and it's really fun to mess around with copy blitz in that 3D space, also DD's team is absolutely amazing. The thing that I like the most about this game is that it's a Kirby game, that says it all. Kirby and the Forgotten Land is a carefully crafted masterpiece, but the thing I like the most has to be the atmosphere alone. Many times levels in games are just grass or spooky ass level, but Forgotten Land gives every location a lot of charm. Same with the characters and the music, it has a certain sense of character that not many games can achieve. The thing I like most about the game is how polished it is, there are pretty much no glitch or bugs, Kirby controls super well and the combat feels responsive. Malfoy mode is fun because you can be a car and run over people. I like that a lot of the attacks don't cause you to stop moving entirely anymore like Camera Neo for example, 
I love the theming. The game really goes all out with it. The game maintains a familiarity despite essentially being a new slate for the series. It has a little bit of something for everyone and I think that's what makes Kirby so appealing. Kirby and the Forgotten Land brings back that lost feeling of exploration that I had missed in a while. Not knowing what secrets the game will have, not knowing the full range of Kirby's ability, this all stems from the game being in third dimension. The abilities. Even though there's only 12 base abilities, almost all of them feel fun and unique to use, especially considering that they can be upgraded over the course of the story. The game genuinely pulled me out of a dark place. I'll spare the details, but I was outright depressed last summer until I got the game. Playing it was just a pure Kirby experience, and it's still a really sorry 3D platformer. As for my favorite part of the game, well... There are so many things to say, but what I essentially love about Forgotten Land is how every single stage stands out and introduces a new concept that gets built up and explored upon throughout and comes full circle. Nothing feels underutilized or overused. A thing I love the most about this game is its consistency. This game is Hall's first 3D mainline Kirby game. The amount of great polish and environment in detail, the uniqueness of each level from one another, and also never once felt rushed, unlike certain games nowadays. I don't know how to perfectly describe it, but the way you're able to explore and just have the enjoyment of going any way you want to go instead of relying on just going left or right, it's insane. Level design. I love how every stage in the game is truly its own set piece. It makes each stage stand out from one another. I can remember all of them so easily. Mouth for Mouth lends well to this with how organically interwoven the mechanic is. Probably my favorite Kirby gimmick. The best thing about this game is how Wild Town slowly but surely evolves as you rescue the Wild Ease. That alone is what made me save all the Wild Ease. I absolutely adore how much content is packed into the game. I mean, there's so much! On top of all the levels they've given us, the treasure roads, the blueprints, the mini games, the extra modes, it's amazing how long this game will last you all while having great replay value. I love when this game makes platform be part of the level sign, like the ventilators in Through the Tunnel. Being platform for secret was so clever and cool. The music. I don't know if your sounds are no, but Forgotten Land has some of the greatest themes in the series that I could go for hours on. Main Team, Alive on Wild D Town, Metamorphonite, Bro Diddy, Roach Limit, I could genuinely keep going. This OS is phenomenal! The thing I like most about Kirby and the Forgotten Land, as I call it, peak. Mouthful mouth. They take a peek at the difference in themselves from other games like Super Abilities, and they also create the coolest ending to any piece of media ever. There are a lot of aspects I love about this game, but one that still impresses me the most is presentation. Kiwi was never this cinematic before. A lot of cutscenes, both big and small, can pass as a genuine high budget animated movie. It's fantastic. The best thing about the game is that it reminds me of Squid Squad. Okay, not everyone has a classic text, but it just goes to show how much people love this game. And from just some simple numbers, it shows. As of the making of this video, Kirby and the Forgotten Land has become the best selling Kirby game of all time, beating the first game of the series, Kirby's Dreamland. Kirby has always been popular, but to think it took 30 years to surpass the first game goes to show that no matter what HAL did, they couldn't escape their past. But taking all those years of experimentation and refinement of the formula, and then introducing that knowledge to the third dimension was genius. Kirby has never been more popular than before. There are a lot of new faces in the community, and we can all point to this game as for the reason for that. And speaking personally, I always been a big fan of Kirby. But for a couple of years after Starlight, I started to drop out of the series. The spin-offs felt predictable and everyone just kept talking about how stale the franchise was. Forgotten Land changed that, and thanks to its success, I'm here. I might have not have done a video on this game at the time, but Kirby getting bigger in general really helped my channel, but most importantly, my life. I met a lot of people thanks to Kirby, a lot of whom I would call dear friends, and would like to take this opportunity to thank them for an incredible past year. If you somehow got to the end, Watch me talk about every single level, every boss, every Waddle D Town upgrade. Thank you. I know I have been teasing about this video ever since Forgotten Land came out, 
And the reason it took so long is because I felt unprepared to take on such a big challenge. And yet, I couldn't make a normal review at this point, I had to give it my all. Maybe the script wasn't paced the best or the editing wasn't top notch, but through the process of writing for this video, I have grown as a content creator. And at least I hope I made some of you appreciate this game just a tiny more. If you are one of those crazy people that got to the end, please comment on how you feel about Kirby and the Forgotten Land. I think you guys have heard enough of my opinions, so share yours. But I will, not much to say. I think I'll make my case on why Kirby and the Forgotten Land is a masterpiece. So, that's all from me, and I'll see you on the next drive.